Hey guys, welcome to Found Flicks. Starting back in 2004, right around this time every year, you could depend on a new entry in the gruesome Saw franchise to be released. This ended with the seventh entry, Saw 3D, that was initially envisioned as the finale to the long-running series. But you can't keep Jigsaw down, and after a several-year hiatus, a new entry aptly titled Jigsaw is coming out this weekend. It's said to be a new story with new characters set 10 years after the seventh entry, but I'm almost positive that it will tie into the others in some way. As we know that at the very least, Tobin Bell is returning as John Kramer, aka the original Jigsaw. It is probably a wise choice to distance the new one from the others, as by the end of its original run in Saw 3D, the franchise's story had become so complicated that it was difficult to know what was even going on without an encyclopedic knowledge of the series. And that is where this video comes in, to give you a full and complete hopefully coherent look at the original seven Saw films with a total breakdown of the series' bigger story and convoluted timeline, since so much of it is revealed in flashbacks. There's even one that has a flashback within a flashback. Yeesh. So let's start at the beginning, not with the first Saw film, but what happened before that which led to John turning into a killer and finding out about his other main accomplices, Detective Hoffman and Amanda, who have been helping him since nearly the very beginning. It's revealed in Saw 4 that John Kramer initially was a successful civil engineer and devoted husband to his wife, Jill Tuck, who founded and operates a rehab clinic for drug addicts. The clinic attracts some patients with bad behavior looking for a fix, including Cecil, who shows up causing a scene when he feels he has been waiting for too long. Kramer calmly confronts the man, diffusing the situation, but Cecil is about to have a much larger impact on his life than he could possibly expect. Saw 4 makes it look like what happens next is entirely Cecil's fault, but 6 reveals more to the story. One night while closing the clinic, we see Cecil urged on by another junkie and later Jigsaw disciple Amanda to break into the clinic. He agrees, appearing at the door, tricking a pregnant Jill to let him inside. And on the way out, he absentmindedly slams the door on her stomach, killing Jill and John's unborn son, Gideon. So while Cecil physically killed their son, Amanda still had a hand in his death, even if unintentional which has an impact for her character much later. After his son's death, John grieved his loss, distancing himself from others, eventually causing John and Jill to grow apart and divorce. And to make matters even worse, he is diagnosed with inoperable brain cancer. Feeling extremely bitter over the life he has been handed, he begins to observe other people out in the world, and becomes even more depressed when he saw them squandering the gift of life they had been given, the same that had been taken away from him with the death of his son. Learning of a radical treatment that could help with his cancer, he sought out help from insurance manager William Easton, but was denied due to his primary physician, Dr. Gordon, not listing that treatment as a possible option. Kramer holds a grudge with William after this incident, as William later goes on to become the subject of the game in Saw 6. Being denied was the final straw for John, who as seen in Saw 2 flashbacks, loses all hope and attempts suicide by driving his car off a cliff. He manages to survive, pulling a large piece of metal from his body, and he emerges from the crash a changed man. After this moment of near death, he began to nurture the idea that the only way man to change is for them to change themselves. The core of the philosophy behind the many people he puts into traps over the years. He believes that they are wasting their lives and wants to test in the most extreme way how much they are willing to do to prove they want to live. So he picks the first subject of rehabilitation, Cecil, having a personal vendetta against him for killing killing his son, and goes about designing and creating the very first trap, which became more and more extravagant over the series. Interestingly, we see Kramer makes little dioramas of his traps before construction, something that he would use in his former career as a civil engineer for buildings, but now he is using his skills to make tiny little dioramas of death. Cecil does end up surviving the trap, cutting his face on a wall of knives, but tries to attack Kramer, falling into a pile of barbed wire, killing him, and thusly ends the first of his tests, or games seen in the series. After Cecil, John devotes the rest of his short time left to design more of these games as a form of instant rehabilitation that would help change the world one person at a time. He became known as the Jigsaw Killer because he always removed a puzzle piece shaped chunk of flesh from those who did not escape his traps. John actually doesn't like this nickname as they don't get the meaning behind the piece cut. The piece taken was meant to represent the idea that these victims were each missing something represented by the missing puzzle piece. 
what he refers to as the survival instinct. Though again, his means to achieve this change in a person is pretty extreme. He always says he's never murdered anyone and that they made the choice themselves. But if you wake up in some mechanical torture machine and a voice is like, you have 60 seconds to gouge your own eyes out or die, I'd be like, wait, what's going on? Give me a minute, Pfft, limbs torn out or whatever. Not really a fair test if you ask me. So that's why not too many people survive John's brutal traps, which are often ironically symbolic representations of the major problem he is testing in the victim's life. And the only way out is through horrifically painful torture of some kind, which is sort of the signature of the series. Eventually, as revealed in Saw 5 flashbacks, John crosses paths with police lieutenant Mark Hoffman, who creates a jigsaw style trap of his own in order to get his own personal brutal vengeance. Mark's sister was was killed by her boyfriend Seth Baxter, who was put in jail, but a technicality allowed him to get out early, serving only five years of his original 25-year sentence. Hoffman, still devastated by losing his sister and the only family he had, doesn't feel that Baxter had done enough time for his actions, and kills him in an inescapable trap designed to look like one of Jigsaw's. And using his position on the police force, places the blame of Baxter's murder on Jigsaw, seemingly getting away with it. But Kramer finds out about it, kidnapping Hoffman, torturing him and blackmailing him into becoming his apprentice in his games. He says that Hoffman should arrest him, but if he does, he will reveal the truth about who really killed Seth Baxter. Hoffman, out of options, is forced to assist Kramer in his rehabilitation, but over time, he becomes a willing apprentice, helping set up many of John's tests from nearly the very beginning, starting with Paul's trap scene in Saw 1. Later, another victim joins John as a protege, junkie Amanda Young. Since we know she is struggling with addiction and was around Jill's clinics as seen in six, this is most likely the reason she was chosen to be tested by John, and he is unaware of the hand she played in his son's death. She is forced to face the reverse bear trap, threatening to tear her face apart, but she gets it off in time, killing her cellmate in order to get the key, and becomes the first surviving victim of Jigsaw's games. Ultimately, she views Jigsaw as a hero who changed her life for the better. And upon Kramer's request, she also becomes his apprentice. But the traps she designs later are inescapable, which is against Jigsaw's intent. The victim at least has to have a chance at survival. John also shows Jill, his ex-wife, a tape of Amanda's survival, and she too becomes knowledgeable of his traps and also becomes an accomplice much later in the series, remaining mostly unseen until four. All of that setup finally takes us to the events of the first film. By this time, Kramer has been doing his test for a while and already has help with both Hoffman and Amanda assisting him. And we see in part three, Amanda specifically help him set up the first film's game with Kramer donning his fake blood in disguise before lying on the floor where he stays for the movie. Though if you just watched the first one, you'd have absolutely no idea about any of this. And this all does help explain how Kramer was able to set up these intricate giant traps while getting progressively closer to death. He actually had a lot of help along the way, we just don't find out about it until later. In Saw, the game is quite simple in comparison to others, devoted to one location and two people chained in a decayed industrial bathroom. Dr. Lawrence Gordon Gordon, the man who told Kramer about his inoperable cancer and whose diagnosis made him unable to pursue the other treatment. And Adam, a surveillance photographer who has been following the doctor due to believing he is cheating on his wife. Adam was hired to follow Gordon by disgraced detective Tap, who believes that Gordon is in fact the jigsaw killer. And it's Adam's occupation that ended up getting him targeted by Kramer, the actual jigsaw killer. And in Saw 3, we learn that it was Amanda under the pig mask that took him from his apartment. Meanwhile, in Flash Backs, we learn more about Tap's investigation into the killings, with him becoming obsessed with tracking down Jigsaw, following a trail of clues from his other traps. As the game's time runs out, he discovers where Gordon's wife and daughter are being held, finding Zepp Hindle, who worked at Gordon's hospital, now looking over Gordon's family and monitoring their game. Chasing after Zepp, Tap follows him into the underground area where the game is, getting into another fight with him, and is fatally shot in the chest. But we find out that Zepp isn't another of Jigsaw's protégés, but is another victim, forced to play his own game. Later we find out he had a tape of his own requiring him to watch over the game and kill Gordon if he didn't kill Adam by six. Not knowing his family escaped, 
Gordon becomes increasingly panicked, using a hacksaw to cut his own foot off in order to escape. He painfully drags himself out of the bathroom, assuring Adam that he will be back with help, leaving Adam all alone. Well, he's not all alone exactly, as John, who is lying there in the middle of the floor this whole time, stands up, revealing himself as the Jigsaw Killer. We see that in Adam's tape, he told him the key to the shackle and his freedom was in the bathtub, and Adam then remembers it falling into the drain as soon as he awoke, dooming him from the very beginning. Jigsaw closes the door, leaving Adam to die in the darkness with the words game over something that ends up becoming used in many of the later films. This is the last time we see of Adam until Saw 3, where he is seen very weakened by his gunshot wound and lack of food. Amanda feels guilty for abducting him, even haunted by his ghost, and in a mercy killing, strangles him to death with a plastic bag. As far as Gordon, he remains completely unseen in the franchise until the very last entry. After escaping the bathroom, he manages to cauterize his wound with a steaming hot pipe thusly surviving the trap. John finds Gordon and helps him on his road to recovery, also making him his next apprentice. And in fact, Gordon was involved in some capacity in every one of the games in the series, we just don't find out about it until the final chapter. Kramer, with the assistance of Amanda and Hoffman, continues his games for over a year. At this point, Kramer finds a new person to target, Eric Matthews, a corrupt detective who had framed and arrested many innocent people over his career, including Amanda. They set up a big game at a location known as the Nerve Gas House involving a test for Matthews. The game has seven people, including his estranged son Daniel, and others who had been falsely charged and arrested by Matthews in the past. Amanda also joins the game, of course not revealing her true involvement, in order to observe the victims and make sure they follow the rules. Matthews tracks down an ailing jigsaw to his hideout, and Matthews' test is already in play at this point. Kramer reveals that he has kidnapped his son and the others in a house filling with nerve gas. And all Matthews has to do to save his son is sit there and have a conversation with him until time runs out. But with his son's life on the line, Matthews isn't willing to play along, and eventually loses his patience beating up Kramer and forcing him to reveal the game's location. And Matthews should have listened because the footage he's been watching the whole time wasn't happening live. It was recorded in the past, and once they make it to the location, the game is already over. Matthews' time then runs out, and in a safe at Jigsaw's warehouse, the door opens revealing that his son had been kept in a safe nearby, with an oxygen mask right next to where Matthews was this whole time. Should have played along instead of letting his desire for vengeance get in the way, which proves to be his undoing. Inside the building, Matthews is knocked unconscious by Amanda and wakes up imprisoned in the bathroom from Saw, chained to the same pipe as Adam previously, with a tape left behind, revealing to him that Amanda is going to take over John's work after he dies, and that Eric is her first subject. Which if watching the movies in order, this would be the first time we find out about Amanda's involvement. And she appears at the door, closing him in the bathroom, leaving him to die. However, as seen in the beginning of Saw 3, Matthews is able to get free, breaking his foot with a toilet lid and then pursuing Amanda. They get in a brutal fight with Matthews demanding to tell him where his son is, but is eventually defeated by her, who leaves him for dead in the tunnels. He isn't dead though, only unconscious, and is later discovered by Hoffman, who drags his colleague to his cell elsewhere in the tunnels. There, he locked him up and left him in a cell for six months, supplying him with enough food and water to stay alive, because he needs him alive for a future game. And at some point after this, Hoffman returned to the nerve gas house to cover things up, disposing of the bodies, and even remodeling the interior to resemble a normal house. And with the end of the events of part two, that brings us to the conclusion of part one of my look at the Saw series. Sorry for breaking this video up, but it ended up being way longer than I had realized. But now you have an in-depth knowledge of the history of Jigsaw and through the second film in the series. And in part two of my video, we will be continuing with the remainder of the series, starting with Saw 3 through the final chapter. Keep an eye out for that tomorrow. Or if it's already tomorrow now, it's probably over there and you can watch it right now. Just click the thing there. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow. Thanks for watching Found Flicks. See you next time.